Hello and welcome to our webinar hosted by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia's Community Development Studies and Education Department. Our topic today is Opportunity Occupations, a discussion of recent research and promising practices. I'm Jean Rourke from the Federal Reserve and I'll be your facilitator. And let me be the first to introduce and thank our presenters for today's call. They are Keith Wardrop from the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, Jocelyn Stewart from Barclays, and Pat Callahan from Tech Impact. If you've joined us via webinar, you'll see us jump to slide two to cover a few call logistics before we dive into our content. You may have noticed that the webinar tool offered the option to listen to the audio through your PC speakers or over the phone. The quality of the PC audio does depend on your connection, so at any time, feel free to dial in to the bridge number. And if you'd like to see the slides a bit larger, click on the small gray box at the top right of the slide window. This will maximize the slide for you. Okay, this call is being recorded, and the archive will be available in the next few days. It will be posted to the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia's Community Development Studies page. And you can ask questions during today's session. At any time during our call, you can type your questions in by using that chat window. All it is is that Ask Question button. You can click there and type your question right in. Let's turn to slide three, and we'll cover some calls. Sorry, excuse me, the legal disclaimer. The views expressed here are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia or the Federal Reserve System. And with that said, I'll advance to slide four and turn it over to Keith. Thank you, Jean. Uh, welcome, everyone. As Jean said, my name is Keith Wardrop. I'm the Community Development Research Manager at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. It's my pleasure this afternoon to discuss some recently released research on employment and to queue up a conversation on workforce development that I'm pretty sure everyone is going to find interesting. On the next slide, I will, before I get started, talk for just a second about my department. As I said, I work for the Community Development Studies and Education Department. And um, each of these 12 Federal Reserve Banks has a community development or community affairs department. We should be on slide five. Uh, my department's official mission is to, is to support the Federal Reserve System's economic growth objectives by promoting community development in low and moderate income communities and fair and impartial access to credit in underserved markets. And we work to achieve this mission um, by conducting research, outreach, and hosting meetings generally in one of four areas, affordable housing, community revitalization, fair and impartial access to credit, and economic inclusion. And it's this last one, economic inclusion, that really motivated the research that I'll discuss today. On the next slide, I provide a very straightforward overview of my remarks. I'm going to start with a little bit of background. Uh, I'll define what I mean by opportunity occupations and then describe the project. Spend just a couple of seconds on the research questions and the data, and then spend most of my time going over the findings. Uh, at the end, I will segue to my co-presenters with just a couple of closing thoughts. On the next slide, we'll see a table that, uh, that I think really illustrates something that we already know, and it's that workers entering the labor force without a bachelor's degree often face low-wage employment prospects. So this table shows the 10 largest occupations in an 11 metro study area that I'll talk about in just a second the 10 largest occupations for which uh, a worker entering the occupation does not need a bachelor's degree. And if you, if you look these over, you can see that we start at, uh, with retail salespersons at the top and we end with janitors. And what you'll notice in the MSA minimum and maximum columns is that most of these occupations are very, uh, are very low wage. Uh, these, in truth, were the kinds of occupations that motivated the research because a lot of these cashiers or waiters and waitresses uh, customer service reps, these were the occupations that I thought of uh, when, I, when I thought about employment prospects for workers without a college degree. And as I said, with, with the exception of registered nurses, most pay very low wages. And honestly, there's a reason why um, I and I'm sure others think about these occupations first, is that these 10 account for 22% of all employment in the 11 metropolitan areas that we studied. And so we decided to ask and answer the question, which are the jobs that are accessible to a worker without a college degree but still pay a decent wage? And on the next slide, you'll see that that's really the working definition that we use for an opportunity occupation. It's one that is generally considered accessible to a worker without a bachelor's degree, 
and that pays an annual median wage at or above the national annual median wage after adjusting for local differences in consumption prices or cost of living. The research that we conducted on opportunity occupations was published yesterday in two reports. The first is called Identifying Opportunity Occupations in the Nation's Largest Metropolitan Economies. And I published that report with my colleagues Kyle Fee and Lisa Nelson at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland and Stuart Andreessen at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. That report focused on the 100 largest MSAs and formed the foundation for a companion report um, called Identifying Opportunity Occupations in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. That report focused on 11 metropolitan areas and will, will form the basis for my comments today. So on the next slide, um, <clears throat> I list the research questions that my colleagues and I started with. Really, when we started, we wanted to answer a few questions related to employment and really try to understand how local economies confer different levels of opportunity on workers without a college education. And so the first two questions are really very basic. What are those occupations? And in which MSAs are they are they most or least present, uh, prevalent? But we'd also read the literature on up-credentialing, which is the practice of employers asking for higher levels of education than the work demands. And so we added on three more research questions. Uh, do online job ads, which um, reflect the preferences for education of employers, do they support the notion that these jobs are accessible to workers without a four-year degree? In which MSAs are employers most or least likely to request a higher level of educational attainment? And then has the, the requested level of educational attainment changed in recent years? On the next slide, I will talk for just a second about the data. I promise to gloss over this slide. I know it's usually the least popular in any presentation, but if you aren't interested in um, in the, the technical aspects of the work, you can find plenty of information in the two reports. I also would like to mention that the two reports are provided in PDF form on the materials uh, tab of the webinar. So for information on employment and wages by occupation and by metropolitan area, we used data from the Occupational Employment Statistics Program, uh, uh, data produced by the BLS. We know, everyone knows, that not every job uh, guarantees a worker 40 hours of work each week. And we thought it was important to incorporate that into the research. So we estimated the median weekly hours worked for each occupation using the current population survey. Uh, we also know that a $15 an hour job in Scranton, Pennsylvania, may not pay the bills as well as a $15 an hour job. I'm sorry, may pay the, may pay the bills better than a $15 an hour job in Philadelphia. And so we wanted to adjust for differences in, in consumption prices or cost of living. And we started with the national annual median wage of about $35,500, and that equates to about a $17 per hour, um, per hour job. And we used these cost of living adjustments to adjust that $35,000 up or down, depending on the cost, of, depending on the, the cost in the metropolitan area. And the adjusted median wage ranged from roughly $33,000 to $40,000. And that's the wage that an occupation would have to exceed to be classified as an opportunity occupation. And so once we understood the pay associated with the work, we then had to uh, associate that occupation with a level of education. And we did that using three different data sets. The first is the employment projections data set, also produced by the BLS. And this data set associates every occupation with one of eight education, educational categories um, predicated on the typical level of education that a worker needs to enter the occupation. The second is uh, a data set that's commonly referred to as ONET, or the Occupational Information Network data. And this data set is based on a survey of current workers and occupational experts. And the survey question is very, very straightforward. It, it asks the respondents, if somebody was hired to do your job today, what level of education would they need? And if at least 50% of the respondents said that the worker would need less than a bachelor's degree, then this occupation would also qualify as an opportunity occupation. And then lastly, we wanted to bring in the employer perspective. And so while all the other data sets I mentioned are publicly available, we did purchase data from a vendor called Burning Glass Technologies. And Burning Glass aggregates or it collects and aggregates all the job postings from 40,000 different websites online every day. Uh, and it converts each job posting into basically a record and a data set. And it extracts up to 70 pieces of information from each record. And the information we were most interested in was the metropolitan statistical area of the job, 
the detailed occupation, and then the minimum education specified in the job ad. It's worth noting that the minimum education may be a preferred level of education, so maybe a bachelor's degree preferred instead of acquired. I, I do want to mention that. And there are a host of other caveats uh, related to using real-time labor market information that you can find in the reports, but because I'm trying to gloss over the data, I won't get into here. On the next slide, <clears throat> we have a table that I think paints a nice picture of how all these data sets come together. Using retail sales supervisors in Philadelphia and Trenton. So in the top line you see, as I said, that we started with a national annual median wage of around $35,500. You can see that the cost of living in both metros is higher, is over 100, so it's higher than the national average. So we adjust that up to between 38 and $40,000 in Philadelphia and Trenton. The, the typical hourly wage for this profession is around $21 in both metros. And at 40 hours a week, that equates to a, a, an annual median wage of between 43 and $45,000. We see that the entry level education is a high school diploma and that more than 50% of the ONET respondents said that this job is accessible to somebody without a bachelor's degree. In the last row, though, we see a little bit of divergence. What we see is that while more than half of the job ads in Philadelphia for retail sales supervisors requested less than a bachelor's degree, only 44% did so in Trenton. So most of the job ads in Trenton for this profession were requesting a bachelor's degree, and so it would not qualify as a as an opportunity occupation in that metro area. So what we did was we, did, we essentially did this calculation for every occupation in each of 11 metropolitan areas in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware uh, using each of the three education data sets. And this allows us to develop three sets of opportunity occupations which can be explored overall and at the metro level. And our research does show that decent paying jobs for workers who didn't go to college do exist, which leads us to our first polling question, Jean. All right, thank you, Keith. I'm gonna ask our participants to grab their mouse and join in. I'm gonna launch our first polling question. And this question should appear on your screen, and I'm gonna read that aloud, and I'll also read you your options, but I do ask that you um, please respond appropriately. Okay, so the question is, which is the largest opportunity occupation in these 11 MSAs? So your options are carpenters, construction laborers, executive secretaries, or registered nurses. I'm gonna give you just a couple of seconds to respond to that polling question. Stall for just one more second as you make your selection. Right, and I'm gonna go ahead and stop that poll and show the group the results. Keith, hopefully that will come up on your screen as well. It did, Jean. I think we have a pretty sharp audience today. Uh, so we, 91% uh, of you said registered nurses. I may, have, um, I may have tipped off the answer in an earlier slide. On the next slide, Jean, we showed the 12 largest opportunity occupations identified in both the employment projections and the ONET data sets. And it's important to note that because these two data sets do measure different things, because they do measure different things, um, there are some occupational differences across the two data sets, and I wanted to include the 12 on which these data sets agree. And so you see registered nurses at the top, and I'll give you a chance to, to look over some of the others. You can see that uh, re registered nurses includes twice the employment of the second largest opportunity occupation. And as you scan through it, I think you'll notice that um, of the 12, I would classify eight as uh, white collar professional occupations and, and maybe four as more of your blue collar manual labor work. But there's a real diversity in the occupations listed here. These 12 represent about 600,000 jobs across the metropolitan areas that we studied but in total, opportunity occupations do make up a significant slice of the economy, as you'll see on the next slide. So using the employment projections and the ONET data set, we see that between 28 and 29 percent of all employment could be classified as an opportunity occupation. Um, employer preferences, as expressed in the online job ads and as, as, um, as analyzed using the burning glass data, lowers that opportunity occupation share to about 22%. Of course, these are overall figures, and there are differences for the 11 metropolitan areas in the study. Um, that leads us to our second polling question, Jean. 
All right, thanks, Keith. All right, grab your mouse if you are listening and if you've joined us in the webinar, and I'll pose that question for the group. And the question is, in which MSA is the opportunity occupation share the highest? Is it Lancaster, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, or Reading? So I'm going to give our participants just a couple of seconds to respond. Make their selection. And I will go ahead and stop that poll and show those results. And Keith, those results should pop up on your screen. And 41% uh, say Philadelphia. Thank you, Gene. I thought that question might be a little bit tougher. In fact, the correct answer is Reading, as we'll see on the next slide. And I'm going to spend a couple of seconds on the next slide, Gene, because I think it makes a couple of really important points. The chart shows the distribution of employment in the 11 metropolitan areas in the study by wage and by the level of education required uh, to uh, required to enter the occupation using the ONET data set. And you'll see that Reading does appear at the top. You can see the opportunity occupation share in dark gray, and at 33.6% 33, 33 for Reading. As I said, it was 28.3% overall using the ONET data set. And at the bottom, you see Atlantic City at 22.3%. In most of the MSAs in the study, occupations for which the annual median wage is at or above the adjusted, the adjusted uh, national annual median wage, so it's the sum of that dark gray and the dark orange section, for most, it, it falls between 44 and 52 percent. You would expect it to be around 50 percent, given the way the way that we analyze the data. But there are a couple of outliers. You see that Trenton, uh, roughly 60 percent of all employment is a, a higher wage, and in Erie and Atlantic City, you can see that that that, that under 40 percent, closer to 38 percent of total employment in those two metropolitan areas represent higher wage employment. I think it's also important to compare the dark teal section, the opportunity occupation section of the chart, to the light blue. The light blue shows the, the percentage of employment that is classified as lower wage before which a bachelor's degree is not required. So while opportunity occupations do make us up a significant slice of the economy, you can see that the light blue sections are significantly larger for each of the metropolitan areas studied. So low-wage employment for workers without a bachelor's degree is still more common than high-wage employment is. And remember, these percentages reflect the view of current workers and experts on the required education. But I think it's important to ask, what are employers looking for? We can see that on the next slide, Gene. This slide shows the percent of job ads requesting less than a bachelor's degree using the burning glass data. And each of the teal boxes represents the percentage for one of the, one of the 11 um, metropolitan statistical areas studied in this report. So for each of the occupations along the x-axis, you're going to have between 6 and 11 teal boxes, depending on how many metros we could actually calculate an estimate for. And where that box falls above the 50% the threshold, it means that that occupation represents an opportunity occupation in that metro area, and where it falls below, that means that employers are more commonly asking for a college-educated a college educated candidate. And you see for the, for the first four occupations, office and administrative supervisors, executive secretaries, computer support specialists, and retail sales supervisors, in one or more metros, uh, employers, uh, employers are, ask, are more commonly asking for a college education in their candidate. For the other six, though, uh, in, each of the, uh, in each of the study MSAs, the percentage falls above 50%, and the occupation represents an opportunity occupation. But I think it's important to ask, what are the implications for MSAs where the educational preferences are higher? So in other words, what happens to a Metro's opportunity occupation share when jobs like office supervisors, executive secretaries, and IT support fall below that 50% threshold and aren't, acceptable to workers, aren't, aren't accessible to workers without a college degree? And so, Gene, let's, let's see what uh, the audience has to say about where this is the most prevalent. All right, Keith, thanks so much. And grab your mouse. We're going to do our third polling question. That should pop up on your screen in just one second. And I will read that aloud for our group. In which MSA do employer preferences for educational attainment lower the opportunity occupation share the most? Is it in Allentown, Philadelphia, Trenton, or York? I'm going to just stall for a second. If I had Jeopardy music, I would play it, but I don't. So you'll just have to listen to me chat for just a second. 
until you make your selection. And I will go ahead and stop that poll and show the group the results. And Keith, it looks like Philadelphia and Trenton with the close 48 and 44. Thank you, Jean. On the next slide, you'll see that those are the two. Those uh, are the two correct answers. Honestly, Trenton um, shows the largest difference in opportunity occupation shares between Burning Glass and the ONET data sets. What that means is that when we calculate the opportunity occupation share based on employers' preferences for education, it falls by about eight percent in Trenton and Philadelphia as compared to that same share uh, based on the views of current workers and occupational experts. You'll see that in, in most, um, in all cases but Atlantic City, that's the case, that the opportunity occupation share is, is lower using the burning glass data than using the ONET data. It's worth mentioning that, that some of this difference is, is probably due to a miscategorization of a few of the occupations in the ONET data set. There's reason to believe that ONET is probably underestimating the level of required education for some occupations, but at least half of this difference is due to the fact that employers are asking for higher levels of education in some MSAs or those executive secretary and computer user support positions that we saw on the previous slide. And given the sheer number of job ads that are posted online, uh, we're actually able to look at change over time. So on the next slide, we can see the difference in the share of online job ads requesting less than a bachelor's degree between 2014 and 2011. So where that difference is, is, is greater than zero, so for the first six occupations, that means there were more openings, the, the, a greater share of openings for workers without a bachelor's degree in 2014 than in 2011, and those occupations became more accessible to, uh, to workers with lower levels of formal education. The reverse is true for the four occupations shown on the right. You can see that by and large over this three-year period, there wasn't a substantial amount of change or any of the occupations except registered nurses. And there we found that 72% um, of ads in 2011 requested less than a bachelor's degree, and that fell to 59% in 2014. So there's an indication that there's a real change in employer preferences for that occupation. It is worth noting, though, that for others, because we don't, we don't control for the location of the job ad or the industry of the, of the job ad, that we can't say uh, definitively that employers change their preferences over this period. And what we hope to do in our next paper is to better control for these differences and better explain uh, changes in educational preferences across occupations, uh, across space, and over time. So on the next slide, my last slide, I'd like to wrap up and just say in closing that most employment for workers without a bachelor's degree is low paying. I think we've seen that and I think we expected that. But there are many decent paying jobs um, accessible to those without a college education, and they really cover a, a real diversity of employment. Roughly 28% of employment in these MSAs meets our definition of an opportunity occupation. Employer preferences for education do tend to lower the share of employment that can be classified as an opportunity occupation. And place really does matter, both in terms of the, of the types of jobs available, but also in, in the educational attainment sought by employers in that place. And there are at least two ways to expand opportunities for workers with lower levels of formal education. Uh, and two of them include um, human capital development and employer engagement. And it's these last couple of uh, topics that my co-presenters are going to build upon. So Patrick Callahan is the executive director of Tech Impact. And he's going to discuss his organization's efforts to provide skills training for young workers hoping to, co hoping to become computer support specialists. And then Jocelyn Stewart will discuss her work at Barclays to provide job opportunities for some of Patrick's graduates, even though they lack a college degree. So with that, I'll turn it over to Pat. Terrific. Uh, thanks, thanks, Keith. Um, you know, obviously this, this um, type of data is very interesting to us, um, you know, and our work at Tech Impact. Um, so uh, very quickly, Tech Impact is a nonprofit organization uh, with our headquarters in Philadelphia. And, um, and then we have some other offices. Uh, we have an office in Wilmington, Delaware, um, one in uh, Redwood City, California, and, uh, and just opening in, in Nevada. And just to tell you a little bit about our, our uh, mission is to empower communities and nonprofits to use technology to, to serve our world better. And we really go about uh, fulfilling that mission in a couple different ways. 
Um, the first is we provide technology services to other nonprofits. So anything from uh, project-based work to migrating organizations to cloud computing platforms, uh, all the way up to fully managing and outsourcing their IT uh, back office. Um, again, that's exclusively for other nonprofits, and it's uh, more of a social enterprise for us. Um, the other uh, thing that we do to fulfill our mission is we provide workforce development programs, and um, the main program that we offer in, in that space is called uh, is called IT Works. And if we can advance uh, to the next slide. Um, it gives a little bit of an overview of what IT Works is. So, um, you know, we are we are working with what's uh, what's being coined now as Opportunity Youth. So these are uh, young people between the ages of 18 and 26. Um, in some cases, they'll be identified as 16 to 26 year olds. Um, depends on on the organization or the. Uh, segment that you're working with, but for us, uh, we work with 18 to 26 year olds and we're looking for uh, folks that have at least uh, uh, high school equivalency, so a GED or, or, um, or high school diploma. And, um, and these folks are below poverty line, so they're either unemployed or severely underemployed. Obviously, uh, working in some of those occupations that would not be considered an opportunity uh, occupation. Um, the structure of the program is such that it's a 16-week course, um, and it follows a curriculum that's been developed by Cisco, uh, which is a, a big IT company. And um, in that uh, curriculum, the uh, students learn everything from the fundamentals of hardware, uh, software, and basic computer networking. It, uh, all of the young people that go through our program earn um, a certification called the Cisco IT Essential Certification, and then 80% of our graduates also earn something called uh, a CompTIA A plus certification, which may not mean a lot to, to most of you, but if you're in IT, um, it would be an industry recognized certification. Um, you know, that a hiring employer would say, you know, this person has the basic qualifications to be a help desk analyst or uh, a desk side technician, you know, break fix hardware technician, uh, and perhaps entry level uh, NOC or a network operations center technician. Um, along with our technical instructions, so the way the program is, uh, it works is the first 11 weeks are, are uh, classroom based. And Monday through Thursday, we teach the technology portion of that. On Fridays, uh, we teach soft skills. And we have a complete curriculum of soft skills that has been developed uh, for us by Accenture and uh, enhanced over time. Um, and it includes everything from helping these young people to create a resume, uh, create a LinkedIn profile, to understanding emotional intelligence in the workplace, um, how to uh, interact with their superiors, how to dress for the job, all different types of topics that they may not have been exposed to uh, during their, their formal high school education. Um, as the last five weeks of the program are an internship, so we work with, uh, with many employers, uh, both in Philadelphia and Wilmington and, and soon to be uh, the Las Vegas area, to provide internships to these young folks. So it gives them an opportunity to go in and, and to a workplace, a, a professional workplace, and see what that's like, uh, get receive continued mentoring, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, a little bit on-job training. You get a chance to test out their new skills. And uh, frankly, it gives the employer an opportunity to learn about those young people and start to integrate them uh, in their own environments. And uh, many times that leads to full-time employment opportunities for, the, for them as well. Um, each student is also assigned a mentor and uh, builds a, a network over time. So one of the other uh, things that we do in class is we bring in a lot of guest speakers and, and, um, and all of the soft skills are taught by volunteers. And I already mentioned building a LinkedIn profile, so they start to network with these folks and get them into their LinkedIn profile. And it really starts to help them build confidence um, that, they're, that they are building a network, build confidence in their skills, and uh, helps them uh, really find the jobs that are available to them out there. Um, so if we could move to the next slide. Um, briefly, just want to touch on some of the outcomes of the, uh, of the program. 
And uh, we started this in 2011, and since that time we've graduated uh, just over 200 students. And we have been ramping that up. It now runs uh, twice a year in Philadelphia, fall, spring semester, and twice a year in uh, Wilmington, fall, spring semester. And we hope to add uh, Nevada to that. And so we're scaling it up to about 100 uh, just over 100 students a year um, going through the program. And 85% um, of the students that we enroll into the program end up graduating the program. So we have a high retention rate. Um, I already mentioned we make sure that every student is provided an internship opportunity. And 100% of our graduates earn at least the, um, the, the Cisco IT Essential Certificate. Uh, full 80% uh, of those will also go on to earn a CompTIA a certification, uh, which is much more difficult for them um, because the, uh, the Cisco certification builds over the course of the program. They take a test at the end of each week to test the knowledge that they've learned in that week, so they have a higher, higher retention rate of that knowledge. The CompTIA comes toward the end of the program, and they need to go to an independent testing center uh, for a test that lasts several hours and is much more um, uh, complicated for them. So if they have not had a lot of background in testing, it can be very, uh, very overwhelming. But uh, full 80% of them end up with that certification, not always on the first try, but we, uh, we encourage them if they're close um, on the first try to, to continue to you know, go back and study and, and, and uh, fill in the gaps of the pieces that they're missing so that they can complete that. Um, because it substantially increases their uh, potential for full-time employment. And you can see 70% of our graduates are employed within the IT sector full-time within six months of graduation, which is, uh, which is really uh, an outcome we're very proud of. Um, a, another 10% of those will actually go back and complete higher uh, education. So uh, we partner with Pierce uh, College in Philadelphia, and all of our graduates are also um, awarded a, a, a small scholarship so that they can continue studies there um, at Pierce uh, in, in the areas that they are interested in. So um, if we could then advance to the next slide. And, you know, I'm often asked, well, you know, how do you scale a program like this? Um, what, what are the essential components? And, and there are really three different things that I look for uh, whenever, wanna, whenever I, you know, we want to start this program in a new, a new place or scale it up. And the first is entry-level jobs. And, and again, that's why uh, the research that Keith and, and the Federal Reserve have published is uh, particularly interesting to me because I want to see what the demand out there is, what, what, how many of these jobs exist out there. Um, that we're training for, um, you know, in the computer technician side. And then I'm also looking for what is the need? So what's the population of opportunity youth? So for us, again, that's uh, young people 18 to 24 that are out of school, out of work, or severely underemployed. Um, and then I'm looking for uh, partners to help support that. So this is, uh, this is the program that we fundraise for, and it's completely philanthropic uh, and supported by corporate and foundation funding. Uh, that, that pays, so the students go through this training entirely free, which is, which is a real benefit uh, to them, of course. Um, so with those three components are, are you know, the most important for, for the expansion of the program. Um, interestingly, you know, I, the one I really like to focus on is uh, the entry-level jobs. So as Keith's research suggests, you know, uh, there are some of those jobs that are available uh, that don't require a bachelor's degree, and the exact same jobs that are available that do require a bachelor's degree. So we really like to uh, try and work with the employers and, and get them to think about uh, those jobs in a different way. Um, and we found that those that do open the doors to these young people without a college, a formal college education, um, you find that they get really good employees. They're highly motivated individuals. They're looking for an opportunity. Uh, they just haven't maybe had the same um, opportunity to get the formal education that that uh, that some of their peers have had. So uh, it can be a really good experience both for the employer and for uh, the young people as well. And uh, one of the programs that I, I like to highlight in particular is uh, is the program at Barclays and its apprenticeship program. And uh, I won't steal uh, uh, Jocelyn's thunder here, but um, I would I would love to see more corporations um, adopt and embrace uh, the types of programs that uh, that Barclay Card is uh, is promoting. And so with that, um, I will 
I will go ahead and uh, just on the last slide, just say, you know, again, we're looking for, you know, forward-thinking employers, um, offering those invaluable internship experiences, um, and uh, with programs very much like the one uh, that Jocelyn's going to talk about at Barclays. And then we always, you know, uh, we like this mantra, think big, start small, move, move fast. You know, when we're thinking about new programs, um, which is another reason I like this, this uh, type of research is it gives us ideas on where we can focus and develop uh, and iterate our programs so that we are meeting the demands of the employers. Ultimately, that's what this is about, right, putting people in jobs. And so we want the employers uh, to want these young people that we're training. So we want to train them for the jobs that they have available uh, to them. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for including me in this uh, webinar and for your research. And uh, I'll turn it over to Jocelyn to comment on the apprenticeship program. Great. Thanks, Pat. Um, so my name is Jocelyn Stort, and I'm the Director of Community Investment um, at Barclay Card in the U.S. And we have a really strong culture here of giving back. And so we're constantly looking for ways that our colleagues can give back in the community, especially in a skills-based way. Uh, and so as we think about that and think about new opportunities, um, we also thought about um, what are the greatest needs in society. And because we're a global bank, um, something that comes up often is the unemployment rate of young people. So we're looking for, um, you know, young people that have a desire and aptitude um, and can really do and succeed in a career, but they, for whatever reason, not graduated from college. And this is a big mind shift, a mind shift for a company like Barclays. Um, if you think about that, um, we looked at this and thought, um, how is it that we can change our thinking to the point where we're not going to only hire people with a four-year degree? And so back in 2010, we actually said, okay, we're going to pilot a program. We're going to go after young people um, with just a GED or a high school equivalent, and then we're going to train them and put them in an apprenticeship program so that we know that they will succeed. And that's why we went for a longer program. It's a two-year program. Um, but it's been amazingly successful. So not only did we start it and pilot in the UK, we then went and launched it in the US. Um, we've launched it in a couple locations now, and we're also locating it um, through Europe as well. So if you turn to the next slide, um, you'll see sort of the details of it. So not just um, young people, it says 16 to 24, but really um, in the US, they have to be a minimum of 18, um, that have this real interest in IT, um, have the ability and have the desire. And then how do you find those people? So they're not coming through the normal channels that we would hire, um, but they we do need to find them. Um, in the UK, when they started, they just put an ad in the paper um, and got a lot of applications. We decided to be a little bit more strategic and so have an amazing partnership with Tech Impact and called them first and said, you know, we need people that you think could succeed here. And luckily, they know enough about Barclays um, and had a class graduating that they handed us a stack of uh, resumes of people that they thought really could succeed. If you don't have somebody like Tech Impact in your area, there's not a problem. You can also talk to community colleges or other nonprofits. I mean, we literally call the community colleges and say, is there anybody that started here and for whatever reason just couldn't continue in school? Um, can you track them down? Can you give them um, can you give them our contact information and see if they'll reach out? Uh, we also do that with high schools, so vocational schools, things like that. Can we, there are people there that they know weren't going on but actually had um, the real desire to do well and to succeed. So um, one of the critical points of success is having those great partners so that you know that the people that you're even getting in to interview actually are, um, have the capabilities and can succeed. Um, if you turn to the next page, um, the benefits of this, I'm obviously a community person, but just because I love the program 
that doesn't make it a sustainable program. It has to work for the business. And one of the big things that we've been um, dealing with here is a tough time finding great people to work in IT. Um, and what happens many, many times is we end up just um, stealing from other banks in town and they steal back from us. So it's kind of a circle. Talented people just go from one place to the other, um, which makes the community people, um, you know, chuckle at the situation. And so we're really trying to go out there and find new pipelines. And this is a new pipeline of talented people um, that we can use uh, in the industry. The other thing is the retention rate is much higher. So they are excited and happy to have a job. And we have changed their lives dramatically. And so in Wilmington, um, we've been doing it for two years, and we have a 100% retention rate. Overall, um, we have a 90% um, retention rate. It also improves the diversity in the IT world. Um, the industry average for females is about 19%. Um, we have about 30% in this program. And we think it's scalable. I mean, we've been successful in scaling it in different regions, um, not just in the U.S., but through Europe. And so what does the future look like? Um, the strength is in the diversity. Uh, what this program really looks like is as good as the managers that we have and as good as the candidates that we have coming in. And so we plan to have over 400 people by the end of the year in this apprentice program. Um, and if it continues on this trajectory, I don't see any reason why that can't double in the next coming years. So what I'd like to end with is just some lessons learned. Um, I really believe that any company can do this and do it successfully. I do think we have gotten a few bruises um, along the way, and we want to share those. We're also happy to talk to anybody who's interested in starting a program like this. There's nothing proprietary about it. We are an open book, and we would love to help. Um, but understand, especially when you're hiring folks um, that are coming from an underprivileged background, um, that they are as smart and talented as anybody in your company and hugely motivated. But they do have some different challenges because they haven't had a job before because they didn't grow up in a traditional situation. And so just understand that. Uh, and so we found that the biggest way to um, work with them is to have an enthusiastic and willing boss. So we don't just put these under anybody. We make sure that the boss um, understands who these folks are and is really willing and looking forward to working with them. We also have a mentor, so somebody different that they can go to, um, just because sometimes it would be awkward to go to your boss. So we really want to make sure there's a safety net around them. Um, the community team takes them out to lunch regularly, um, in the beginning especially, and the idea behind that is we want to be their friend. We want to have them come to us whenever they're having issues, um, and we want them to feel comfortable. And it's funny what you hear when you go out to lunch with these guys, when they let their guard down. I'll just give you one very um, funny situation. One of the um, original cohorts, um, a really incredible um, young lady who was hitting the ball out of the park, uh, told us that she loved um, going out to eat and that she loved the best restaurant in town uh, and that she was actually going out there to eat three to four times a week. She loved it so much. And so we all got a big chuckle out of that. But let's just say afterwards we had a very serious discussion about budgeting and about saving money and that maybe um, even though she was making you know, more money than she ever thought possible, which was our just um, entry-level wage, um, that she really needed to start a savings account. So we have since ramped up and will continue to ramp up what we do for them um, on the financial literacy part. Um, there's a lot they don't know about health plans. They don't know about 401Ks. And all that can, is simple. You just, if you understand it coming in, it's very easy um, to, to check that box and make sure that they feel good about it um, and that they're not embarrassed or ashamed to ask questions about that. Um, we also want to make sure that they feel part of our community. Um, you know, sometimes their home life is a bit stressed, so we make sure they know all the other people coming in through this program and that we, they're part of our young professionals network. So we really do a lot to make sure that they feel welcome and that they belong. We also give them a promotion and a raise as the, you know, if they want it after the first year um, so that they're not just stuck in this two-year um, cycle, but they really understand that there is growth potential 
for them. Um, and I think at the end, communication is really the key. So talking to them constantly, asking them how we can improve the program, telling them what we think they can do better is all really important to being successful. And at the end of the day, um, the stories that you hear about how this has changed people's lives is really pretty extraordinary. Um, you know, a guy was just talking to one of the new people um, uh, last week and said, was explaining the program to him and was talking about how it had affected his life and that he had spent most of the time on the couch trying to figure out where his next meal was coming from, going from one person's couch to the next. Um, and the only work he could find was around the holidays. So he looked forward to the holidays just so that he could work. Um, and now he was at Barclays every day and he was thriving and he was happy. Um, and he said, I'm an inspiration for my friends. Uh, I love it. You know, I couldn't be happier. And he's referred a few people into the program. So it really has been a success both from a business um, perspective and a community perspective and also from the apprentice. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Jean. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. And I just advanced to slide 33, which is how our participants can ask a question. Um, so. If you've got a question ready for our presenters, go ahead and click that Ask Question button and type it right on into that, onto your webinar, onto your screen, excuse me, and then I will queue uh, keep those questions up for our presenters. All right, but we did get a couple of questions in, so I will start with a question for Keith. Uh, Keith, what are the pros and cons of using real-time labor market information from burning glass and similar data providers? Sure, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question because this is a new, it's a new source of information and uh, it, I think it can be very valuable in the workforce development field and it, of course is also, uh, as well for research. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of pros and cons. I think the, the, the greatest advantages that we saw to using this data was that it gave us the insight of the employer. You know, the other data sets that we used um, were based on surveys or, or assessments from uh, from government agencies, but, uh, but they didn't necessarily represent the views of the employers. We could also get some real geographic specificity. You know, the other data sets, again, were national in scope, and I think we know that, that and, we've, and we've learned by using the burning glass data that there can be real local differences. And then um, there's, you can understand annual variation better, and there's uh, generally just a large sample size. I did mention there are a number of caveats, though. Um, the, there is research that shows that the, the jobs that are posted online and therefore the jobs that Burning Glass and, and, and its competitors aggregate and collect um, are not evenly, are, they're not really a, a perfect representation of, of, of job openings everywhere because oh, it's, there are certain occupations that are more likely to post their openings online. Um, typically it's occupations that are requiring higher levels of education, higher levels of skills. And honestly, um, the data that are extracted from, from the ads are not perfect. You know, we're talking about having to write algorithms that pull uh, up to 70 pieces of information from, from uh, the, the text of a job ad. And so uh, there are varying levels of accuracy depending on the data that you're looking at. And I think one of the, one of the problems that we ran into is that um, it wasn't, we weren't certain what to do with the ads that didn't have a level of education specified. And that was true of about half of the ads. So it was sort of making judgment calls and, and uh, developing rules for how you deal with the missing data was a challenge too. All right, thank you, Keith. We did get another question in, and it looks like this one is for Pat. Pat, how successful have you been at placing your graduates with companies other than Barclays? Is there a secret to successfully getting companies on board? Um, yeah, that, that, great question. Um, and uh, and uh, obviously, uh, lo I spend a lot of time on this and, and do a lot of work, um, you know, educating various employers on, on the benefits of uh, bringing these folks into their workplace. I mean, I think Jocelyn, you know, hit it on the head. Uh, not only are these highly productive individuals with a high level of motivation, um, but it's also really good for the culture of the organization uh, to see some diversity coming in and, uh, and 
a feeling that the company really cares about the community around them is important to your other employees uh, in the organization. So, so I do spend a lot of time uh, educating on this. But, uh, and I will say, you know, the banking industry has been been leaders in this uh, for us, especially in in the Wilmington market. Uh, so we work with. Um, you know some of the larger larger uh, bank institutions in that area, uh, but it's not exclusive to that by any means. Um, in fact, uh, because of the other work that we do, which is uh, working with a lot of nonprofit organizations, um, we're very connected in that community as well, and we find that they're looking to augment their staff with, um, you know, especially the larger ones with IT support individuals. So. Uh, many of them end up working at uh, at nonprofit organizations, which is which is really cool. Um, but then every every industry in between. Um, uh, the other thing I'll say is we you know we bring in um, through our volunteers is really helpful as well because some of the volunteers that we work with can be placement agencies, um, and they're actually really instrumental in in helping our students get jobs because they're financially motivated to do so, right? So they they see the job openings, they're working with the employers they know what's out there and they know by volunteering with us who the really um, good students are and they'll uh, they'll work to get them placed uh, with various employers and as that happens you know we'll start to build a relationship with those employers over time so so there's a lot of uh, a lot of methods to to the to the means here but um, but I think you know with heightened awareness of the 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 issue, which is that we have a very large population of opportunity youth in the United States um, and a, a large skill gap, uh, particularly in technology, that um, that I think employers are starting to realize, hey, you know, we can get some really talented people that don't necessarily have a bachelor's degree. All right. Thank you, Pat. All right. We are getting a couple of additional questions in, but if you have a question, click that Ask Question button, type it on in there and I can announce that for our presenters today. So Keith, it looks like this one is for you. Why would employers in one MSA require higher educational levels than another MSA? You know, that's a fantastic question and it will be the subject of our next, of our next uh, paper on this topic. Um, you know, I, I, my suspicion is that uh, it could be one, up to one of three things. The first is that in one metropolitan area, the types of jobs, the industry hiring for an occupation might be different than in another. So if uh, a large university is a dominant employer in one metro, uh, they may have different um, educational expectations for, say, um, a computer user support specialist than um, in another metro if the largest employer is, say, Best Buy. So same occupation but different industry and, and different expectations. Um, I think it could also uh, have to do with the labor force characteristics. So if you have a very highly educated labor force, then it may be that you can be slightly choosier and, and ask for a higher level of education, even if it isn't necessarily required. And then along those lines, uh, it could simply be uh, the, 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 the size of the pool of the candidates out there. So if a metropolitan area has a uh, uh, higher level of unemployment, more job seekers, then it could be that, um, again, the employers could be a little bit choosier and, and ask for that education, whereas in a tighter labor market, they may not. Okay, thank you, Keith. Uh, this next question is for Jocelyn. Jocelyn, if another company were interested in starting a similar apprenticeship program, what words of advice would you offer? Uh, I think that I would offer, first of all, having a conversation with me um, offline. Um, I'd be very willing to do that, um, and then I can get a, a good read on what you're um, thinking about. But I would also, I think, um, first try and find somebody like Tech Impact in your region or community college or vocational school that can actually offer um, some really great recruits. Um, and then I would talk to the specific people that would be their managers and make sure that they're on board um, because it is not hard. They are fabulous employees, and if you just get over these few little, um, you know, unusual circumstances, you can really have some great employees. 
Okay, thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, Keith, this question is for you. Reading also scored high, four out of four out of the largest 150 MSAs in the job quality measure in the 2014 labor market 150 index. We interpret this result in our high proportion of manufacturing and healthcare sector jobs. Do you plan to take your analysis from occupation to an industry sector level? You know, I, I can't say that I plan that far in advance, but I do think it's very important. Of course, the, um, the industry mix in a place is going to dictate the types of jobs that are available. And as we all know, industries, industries employ um, multiple occupations from a secretary at the front desk to a sales team to people working on the shop floor and then drivers uh, to deliver the product. But I do think it's extremely important, and I do think that uh, if, the, if the person asking the question is from Reading, uh, I think that um, it is true that the high level of production jobs and, and work in manufacturing certainly um, played a role in Reading being at the top of the list in our, in our report. Uh, and so I, I do recognize in, in one of our reports, I think in a footnote, that the interrelatedness of industry and occupation is extremely important, and I think it is an area that is worth pursuing. All right, thank you, Keith. We, we do have a couple more questions, and, and we only have about two minutes left, so I, I'm going to try to get these questions in. Um, the next question is, could a bank receive CRA credit for running a similar program? Pat, are you able to answer that question? You know, not not directly. I, I would probably defer that more to Jocelyn. I, I, I do believe banks um, build this into their CRA programs, but CRA programs, you know, are very delicate things that you really should be discussed with an, an auditor. Um, any any other thoughts on that, Jocelyn? Yeah, we would list it um, when we're being audited by um, CRA um, because, you know, it's for people that, um, are low income or in low income geographies, um, and it would so they would look at it favorably. It's not like a loan or something like that that they give the most points to. But you could definitely talk to um, your auditors and find out exactly what um, what the case is. Okay, we have one minute left, so I'm going to squeeze in this last question. Barclays sounds fantastic, but is Barclays normal? The burning glass data shows that more job postings are requiring a degree compared with the ONET and occupational projections data. Isn't, un uncredentially, uh, isn't uncredentially by employers continuing just as our college dropout rate has reached 45%? I think we're not unusual. I mean, I do think we put a lot of time and energy into um, giving back. But as I said, if it doesn't work for the business, it's not going to be sustainable. And so I think maybe we're just um, one of the first companies to figure this out, that we really need to look outside just straight college grads for really fantastic talent. And I hope um, that it's just the beginning, you know, the tip of the iceberg. Um, but I can't over – I can't exaggerate to the extent that these folks are really doing a fabulous job um, in working for us as colleagues. I'll add to that that I think uh, Barclays is unusually thoughtful in their approach to, to how they work with these young people, although more and more companies are starting to embrace this. Um, but when I'm asked, you know, how do we scale this program, is it, is it about money? And my answer is always, this isn't about money, this is about opportunity. We need organizations to think differently, open, open their minds and open the doors to these folks because there are some really talented people that are getting overlooked otherwise. All right, thank you, Pat and Jocelyn. Keith, do you have any closing remarks before I close out our session today? I would just like to thank uh, Eugene and, and Pat and Jocelyn and all of our, all of our listeners. And please uh, reach out to me directly if you have questions about the research or ideas for future, for future projects or webinars. All right, well, thank you, Keith. And back to you. Uh, I'd like to thank our presenters as well today for your time. And I will be sending a short uh, survey out very shortly, so please take just a moment to let us know how we did today. This concludes our webinar. Have a great day.